thank you all for coming and, and joining us to talk about DeFi on the Agoric platform. I'll give some background on Agoric, um, talk about some of the concepts of what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then, and then bring you into the code. Um, we do have a Agoric Discord up, and there is a channel um, uh, in DeFi Workshop, for which is the best place to ask questions. Um, we will also uh, try and keep an eye out on chat here, but mostly the chat here will be um, uh, 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 Santi relaying things um, and links and, and pasting the links here. So at the top of the Zoom chat is the link to Discord. Um, and uh, if you jump in there, it'll be easier to record and follow and have people join in um, afterwards. So thank you much for that. Oh, let me skip that. So I'm going to talk, introduce uh, some of the key concepts in Agoric before I, before I dive into specifically the code. Um, and no, this is not chilling or anything like that. You just need to be oriented in what we're doing. Our focus is a blockchain, which will be a public blockchain for next year, for rapid development of DeFi, right? Um, uh, DeFi has, um, uh, you know, projects have gone from taking years or months to ship down to mere weeks in the case of something like Uni, uh, the, the Uni token. But it's really a new frontier for finance. So it is, like most new frontiers, it is exciting uh, but quite, but but very dangerous. You know, the kinds of things that we address are the poor performance of the underlying execution engines, whether it's volatile gas prices or the slow finality. Um, we 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 care a lot. You know, th those those kind of come out of proof of work systems. But proof of stake systems have their own challenges with economic pressure towards centralization and missing economic structure that you need for the proof of work world to to flourish. Those are merely background for what we're doing here. Our focus in this presentation is around um, solutions that address some of the key areas of poor developer experience, whether it is the deep security hazards or most importantly in this context and most importantly, um, the, the, the composition, the new model of being able to build new components rapidly and safely by combining um, uh, existing components. And I'll say a little bit more about that before I move on because that's crucial. You know, I mentioned Uni. Uni came out in weeks where they took the compound governance contract and they put it together with their stuff to release a, a new token on Uniswap. And that was awesome and that was successful and that's very exciting, but it was also unusual and a special case. Um, the, the Uni governance stuff fit exactly what they needed and they had background information to be able to pull all this stuff together. And so they had kind of everything working for them. Lendef.me did the same thing where they took compound governance code, put it together with their stuff, rolled out a system which they then lost $25 million as, as the resulting system had a bug, right? Code copying for reuse is something that people have done since, you know, there have been computers, but it's unsafe. It's not, it's not a fast way to get reliable growth and execution. We need better solutions to that. Okay. So our platform is all about accelerating DeFi. It will be a layer one chain built on Tendermint using Cosmos SDK. Um, I won't go into the gas economics this round, but, but what you'll be seeing and what I'll be showing you code wise is that we build smart contracts in a secure version of JavaScript using familiar patterns. So the reason why NPM took off, the reason why React took off is that you could build software using components and building on components that other people built. So it's not that you're copying their source code and modifying it, though that of course was possible as well. It's that most React applications, right? A, a, a new beginner building UI using React can grab a carousel of images plugged together with a sales shopping cart UI, put them together and have an art application that's, that, that 15 years ago, an expert would have been challenged to produce. And they do so by not having to understand the details of what does it take to do each piece, but rather understand how to use them, put them together and build a system out of them. And so that, that familiar model of taking objects and plugging them together is what we bring to, um, to DeFi components. And that model also gives you our partitioning where, you know, in the same way that, yeah, I don't need to know about the mechanics of rendering, I, don't, I can have security 
and, and, and risk management as part of individual components where they've already been reviewed, I'm using them unchanged rather than taking source code, modifying it and invalidating security reviews and analysis that people have already done. All right, so let me, by the way, I do have the, uh, the uh, 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 various chat windows up here if there ends up being a big question here. But, um, uh, 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 but so, so feel free to chime in um, for questions and clarifications as we go. If they're big questions, we'll take them at the end. So finally, we have a system that's really built for DeFi. It has some of these smart contract components that I'm talking about here are actually used as part of the infrastructure. So the same smart contract infrastructure, you would be able to have the staking and rewards and derivatives and, and all that sort of thing as part of the overall economy of the system. That's as much as I'm gonna say about this here until we're, uh, until we're done. The fundamental thing is this simple composition of financial logo, Legos, and, and, and I'll, and I'll uh, be showing code for that in a moment. Okay. So the technical stack of Agoric, as I mentioned, it's Cosmos SDK underneath. We have an infrastructure for having separate contracts and separate components all securely confined from each other. That's the Agoric VM. So unlike, uh, so, so, so Agoric extends Cosmos or Polkadot or these systems that we are connected to with, 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 with interop protocols, extends them with having a VM chain. So instead of, you know, so, so like with Ethereum, you can permissionlessly deploy smart contracts to cooperate in an ecosystem of other smart contracts. Above that, excuse me, we, you know, right, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when browsers first got JavaScript, experts could do a few little things. But the reason why it has so much power now, whether it's on the server side with Node or uh, in embedded systems with Modable or in the browser with, you know, with, with all the normal JavaScript stuff, is that people are able to build with these libraries. I use the example of React or Vue or Svelte or you know, the, the, the GraphQL or all of these things where they're able to have a framework that has objects that are in the domain they care about, whether it's widgets or something else. ERTP is a JavaScript API, well, it's, it, it is a general API protocol that we render in JavaScript for being able to compose financial elements. And I'll talk more about that. And then Zoe uses that to provide a framework for, for a safe composition of, of, of contracts. And then I'll go into the, the user-defined contracts. So let me dive into the ERTP and, and I'm gonna introduce a few more concepts and then we'll start looking at code, get a few more concepts and then really dive in. So ERTP, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol is this API developed literally over decades, right? Agoric was founded by pioneers in the space of smart contracts. We've been doing some of these things in commercial, large scale, interesting, disruptive uh, financial systems um, uh, outside of blockchain. And a lot of the ideas of perc you know, were percolating back in. So the key elements, and I talk about the issuer kit, the key element is for every new kind of digital asset, there are a set of, of helper objects that work together. So first, there are purses. I can have generic purses and I, and I have purses that contain a particular kind of asset. So I'll have purses that contain my, my um, uh, pegged Ethereum. I'll have purses that contain my underlying token. I'll have purses that contain my concert tickets. So it's, a, it's an account for a specific kind of asset. A payment is a thing that you can withdraw from a purse in order to transfer that particular kind of asset. So a payment of a concert ticket, a payment of Quatlus or simoleons or whatever the local currency is. Those are all, so fungible token, the ability to transfer fungible and non-fungible tokens or other kinds of rights are done with payments. An issuer is this thing that the kit wraps around. The issuer is the thing that if someone hands me a payment, I can claim it and I can verify that it is, that it is a payment of the asset I was expecting. You know, it's an object-oriented system. If you hand me an object, I want to verify that it is a payment of the simoleon cash that I was expecting and not a payment of your favorite pirate cash for the, for, for the uh, uh, store down the street. Right? And then finally, there are mints, where mints are the engine that let you mint new payments. Right, so, so for a given currency, I will have this kit of things to be able to mint, verify, save, and store um, uh, all these payments, okay, or all, all, the, all these digital assets. 
And then these are organized or identified or analyzed with two more elements. The brand is just an atom that says, yes, this, this is distinctly, you know, the, the, the peg deeth, this is distinctly atoms, this is distinctly um, concert tickets for this particular uh, concert venue, whatever kind of asset it is, the, 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 the atom is exactly that brand. And then finally, there are amounts, where with a fungible token, an amount is simply a, 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 a number. So I have you know, 40 simoleons, I've got 2,000 atoms, whatever it is. But for non-fungible tokens, amounts just work, and there's a math that goes along with them, where it is seat E4, E5, and E6 of a particular, th of a particular um, uh, theater. So uh, Anu asked the question, what's the difference between a purse and a mint? A purse is an account. It's the thing that holds it. it. It's not able to create it. I can only get assets into a purse by having a payment and depositing it. The mint is the currency, is the thing that, that, that creates the underlying new instances. So if I want to have a currency that there's a fixed amount, I mint you know, 50,000 units, and then I throw away the mint, and now no more units can be minted. We can all transfer them around with, with payments and deposit them into purses and verify that we got the right thing by issuers and describe, you know, it's 20 bucks. It's not, I'm not handing you a $20 bill. I'm just telling you the price is 20 bucks. That would be an amount, right? And so all of those things we can do after having destroyed the mint, but the mint is necessary if you're going to keep issuing new, new elements of that particular uh, currency, that particular token, uh, non-fungible or fungible token. Dean, can you, we have, we have a question that, that what, what's the primary difference between a purse and mint? Yeah, that was what I just answered. Yes, thank you. So did that answer your question, Anu? Great, okay. Um, so actually, I, conveniently, I have another screen here with these, with these chat windows up. So, so you please do break in uh, uh, as you see any, and I'll try and, and note when I'm answering questions. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a bunch of DeFi Legos you know, the two columns here, there are more, and this is, you know, this is just the start. The more are the ones that, 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 that hopefully you all build. But the first four are already covered by ERTP. They're the fundamental glue, the electronic rights transfer protocol elements. So the purses are just, you know, I can have a purse object and I can hand it to you. That is the thing that my wallet deals in is it has a collection of purses for different currencies that I can put things into. Payments are these things that I can pull out of purses and send to people, claim, deliver, and so forth. And payments are an object abstraction that lets me not just share with you access to an amount, but let you claim it. It lets you do the linear transfer of uh, fungible and non-fungible tokens underneath. And then fungible and non-fungible tokens are just automatically supported by the existing mint infrastructure. And I'll be showing you how that's created, but it's pretty much a one-liner to add your own currency. So every dApp under the sun that, that, you know, that needs a liquidity token, they'll end up having a make me a mint. Now I can mint out liquidity tokens or, or NFTs. I can mint those out. And then finally, we'll dive into the other. The, the, so everything that's not in bold on this slide is a smart contract implemented using ERTP, using those, those, those uh, uh, four elements there and the ones that I showed you on the screen, and then using our smart contract framework, I'll be diving in de in, in, into the ones on the left, the faucet, the OTC desk, and the covered call, and, and showing how they work and how they wire together all these different elements. OK, so we're going to dive into some contract code here. Um, there is a new, you know, so, so um, uh, in the prep for this, uh, 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 for this workshop um, was a link to the getting started with alpha and that showed how to get your world prepared where you've got a command line where you can issue uh, Agoric commands. And then, and then we're going to go through the steps of this particular dap, the, the, the fungible faucet. So now, first off, I'm going to jump over to another workspace here. My question is, can you see this other workspace or not? Or are you still seeing the presentation slide? Santi? Ah, oh, you can see the other workspace, great. That means I can hop around between workspaces, which will make life a little bit easier. All right. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and go into a directory. So, so uh, I have up here the instructions that I just described on that link. This is the DAP fungible faucet and its installation instructions. And so I'm going to make a directory, cd to dev, uh, make a directory for workshop. 
Um, Dean, can you make your uh, text a little bit bigger? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Can, is that the, is that better, folks? That's a lot better. Okay. Do the same over here. You know, I'll need more than one window, so. All right. Okay. Um, so now uh, I'm going to do exactly this set of things. The agoric init here is um, is going to instantiate a brand new. It's going to grab a template. Whoops. Uh, oh, sorry. I need to go into workshop. Now let me do that again. Okay. So it is going to just like with with uh, um, uh, other example system, uh, you know, other systems with templates. It's going to create a new directory um, based on that command. Just so you can read the command here, uh, agoric init, and it grabs as a template that fungible faucet and makes the directory my fungible faucet. So I'm now going to um, cd into my fungible faucet, and what you can see here is I got a directory tree. Uh, here, LS. Um, uh, that has a contract subdirectory with an initial smart contract, an API subdirectory with a cloud application server to be able to connect to this smart contract, and a UI subdirectory with a with a um, uh, a page to be a, with with a user interface to be able to interact with this smart contract. Right. If what you're building is a DAP, you might have all three of these. And so this is an example smart contract that has all three of them wired together. Uh, and it's very simple. Um, let me go through all of the steps that you would go through. So I'm going to do an Agoric install. Oops. Agoric is the command uh, that, um, uh, if, that, that uh, is used for, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and make this bigger so the, so the text is, is readable here. Um, is is the command is the command line tool for for being able to manage the development environment here. So if I go agoric install, that's going to connect to my already deploy. You know my my agoric my agoric SDK installation. It's going to leverage libraries that were already built and installed there, following the the getting started preparation steps in the links previously. Let me grab these instructions. I will then. Agoric start reset. And what that will be doing is that will actually launch a simulated chain here um, so that, you know, it, so that I can deploy, debug, iterate with, interact with chains running locally on this machine. I can, no, I can see the Zoom chat, but I can no longer see Discord here. So. <laughs> All right. The install takes a minute here. Um, and then what I will do is I'm going to deploy the two contracts. So if I go to one of these windows, I'm going to go, let me get them to the right, to the right place here. So CD, uh, CD to dev slash workshop slash my fungible faucet. And I'm going to bring up VS code. All right. So I have now done this installation here. I'm now going to start the chain in the empty state. That's what the reset does. Okay, and now the, the, the chain is started. I will go to, you know, following the, uh, the instructions here, I will now go to another window and I'm going to deploy the, the, I'm going to deploy the contract to the chain and then I'm going to deploy the API to the server. So what I've instantiated here is I've got a chain running and I've got, uh, uh, and I effectively have a separate environment that represents the cloud environment to which the API server will be deployed. Okay, let me go to this window and I will uh, do that here. That's just two different commands, uh, deploy scripts in each of the two directories. I take you to, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. So it's currently going through the, the, the deploy steps here and it has now successfully deployed them to that chain. And finally, I will go to a, a third window um, and CD to the directory and start now. Oh, uh, CD dev slash workshop. Okay. 
and um, go to the UI. And now I'm just starting the React, the normal React development environment, right? So that's starting up the React server so that I can actually run um, uh, 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 an app on this server. Okay. And so let me just open a new browser here. And this is now the application that is the fungible fossil. Okay. So I will talk about that in a moment. But what it's saying here is, is it, it wants a connection to my wallet. And in this DAP, um, uh, uh, the, it shows, here's what I need to go do in my wallet. Since this is an illustrative DAP, here's what I need to go do in my wallet in order to be able to, 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 to launch um, uh, in order to be able to connect the browser to the wallet. We're also working with MetaMask so that it'll be part of the future MetaMask plugin. And we have various other wallet things here. I'm showing you the, I'm showing the, you the particular one where you launch it using Agoric Open. Now, if you're on a Mac and not in my interesting, bizarre hybrid of, of, of Windows and um, uh, 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 I hear someone's mic open. Is there a question? Ah, okay, someone's mic is open here, so let me. Assuming I can find the, uh, the, the, the zoom controls, I will mute that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, so. Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah. So I was bringing up the wallet. Here we go. So um, in in a normal in a normal application or in in a, in a normal platform, you would be able to. This would happen automatically, right? So 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 it would come up when you set Agoric open. All right. So you can see the app on the right. You can see my wallet on the left. And what has appeared in the wallet is the mention of that app that wants to connect. Right now, I have not given the app, for, the app permission, so it can't see anything in the wallet. It can't get any of the assets. Um, and it, it claims it wants to be called Fungible Faucet. I will now enable that app. Um, and, uh, and so now it can talk to it. Now the app can talk to it. And you can see that, it is, that up here in the upper right, the, it is connected to the wallet. The only thing I can do in this app is mint some fungible tokens, right? So I'm going to mint fungible tokens. And what that did is that sent, and, and, and I'll go into the mechanics of this, that sent an offer to the user, right? And the offer to the user is, is you know, the offer, the, the, that sent an offer to the user in the wallet for the user to approve sending it to the contract. So it's not that the user interface got to act on behalf of the user. It got to propose to the user, here's a thing that in my application you chose to maybe want to do. Did you want to approve that or decline it? And so in this case, the fungible faucet instance running on port 3000 over here said, go ask the app for a thousand fungible tokens and see if you get them. Right? So I'm not paying them anything. It's not an exchange in an interesting fashion in this case. We're just going to go ask for some money out of the faucet. And I say, yeah, I would like to do that. And you can see down here, here is my, 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 my purses, right? I mentioned purses are like accounts. So I've got my apps here that I'm connected to. I've got my set of accounts with various different currencies where it may be that I have multiple purses in the same currency. Um, but, but here I have the one for getting the fungible tokens from this, from this uh, uh, faucet DAP. And I will say accept. And what happens is you can see here the fungible DAP said, the, the wallet said, uh, I've, offer, I've completed the offer. The fungible DAP said, I've sent you a thousand tokens. And indeed, as soon as I let my browser proceed, you will see that a thousand tokens appeared in my, in my wallet, uh, in, in, my, in my wallet, in the purse that takes fungible tokens, right? I could, I could do that again. I would get exactly the same interaction where I could accept that offer. And now I've got 2000, right? So it's just a very simple application um, for requesting money in this token type. And tomorrow it'll have another wrinkle on it where we will add the ability to then buy things with that token. I'm going to show you that kind of thing in another application. Okay. So we're going to now, we're going to now dig into some of these code, th th these things after I first hit a couple of more concepts here. So what's going on, right? With this offer stuff, right? In, in, in MetaMask, and in fact, our friends at MetaMask, Dan Finley, um, gave me this particular screenshot from his application. The fundamental thing you do is you send money to a random number, 
right? If I want to pay John, I pretty much send money to my good friend 0x55e27, blah, 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 blah. And that's true in MetaMask for Ethereum, you know, where, where the thing that's weird about this is, yeah, it's all about this number down below. And that's true in Cosmos as well. It's true in all of these various systems where I'm sending money to my good friend, you know, 1GHKM, right? That's not how businesses work. That's not how humans actually like to do trade. What you actually want is quid pro quo, where, you know, this is a Uniswap-like thing. It's not that I'm going to send $3,000 to a random number and hope that some money lands in my account in a different currency. I'm going to make an offer. Right. I'm going to say, I will provide 3,000 moolah from my savings account if you give me back 2,000 simoleons. Or I'm going to provide 30 quatlus if you give me back a concert ticket. Right. And the infrastructure of our smart contract system and the infrastructure of our wallet honors that directly. Right. So what happens is, let's say I'm bidding in an auction for a concert ticket. Right. Oh, yes, that's, that's, that's the thing that happens, right, is I will pay this much money in order to receive that much, those much goods, right? So I, I, I will give you one thing, and I want another in return. Okay, and so we have this pervasively in the framework for smart contracts that is built above ERTP. We're in that scenario where there's an auction for a concert ticket. The seller is just making an offer that says, I'll, I'll offer someone, I will give this concert ticket, but what I want in exchange is at least X moolah, okay? And the buyers in this auction, they say, well, I will offer you at most Y moolah, and what I want in exchange is a concert ticket. And, you know, as I, as I showed you with the assets and the ERTP and the, and the issuers, I can be much more specific. I want a concert ticket in seat thus and such at a particular date at this venue, right? And so that structure of, of amounts lets me describe, here's exactly what I want. Here's exactly what I'm willing to give you. And what, and, and what the Zoe contract infrastructure does is it will take those offered assets it will escrow them asynchronously behind the scenes in the contract infrastructure and then invoke the contract. And so that means the contract is running, knowing that the assets are available, but not in a position to steal them or do something bad with them. The only thing it can do is reallocate who has what in a way that satisfies their requirements. So in the case of this auction, right, it can reallocate the concert ticket to the highest bidder and the money from the highest bidder to the seller of the concert ticket. And that's a reallocation that happens atomically and safely and only succeeds if it meets these, I want X for no more than Y, if it meets the constraints on the offers that the participants in the contracts provided. Okay. Now, in that, per, in that faucet example, the only constraint was, you know, this offer will succeed if you give me a thousand moolah and I'm not giving you anything. Very simple, one-sided kind of exchange. And so that's why I didn't dig into the, the rest of the offer stuff there. But fundamentally underneath, the entire interaction that's happening is more about this quid pro quo. And so it satisfies the offer constraints of each of the offers. And it satisfies uh, conservation of currency so that there's no magic creation of tokens, except explicitly in the place where a mint says, you know, I'm authorized and here's some new, to new, new tokens of a particular type. Hmm. Okay. And then once an, offer, once an offer is completed or once a contract is completed, once an offer is what we call exited, then there are payouts where if I had the offer that was the winning offer, I get my money or I, you know, I get my concert ticket and everyone who did not have the winning offer gets their money back. And the important thing that, is, that, that, that the clients get out of this is they get what we call offer safety. And offer safety to the clients is that they will get their desired payout, the concert ticket, or a refund of their money, the quatlus or moolah or whatever we, currency it happens to use for that, for that exchange, regardless of the behavior of the contract. It doesn't matter whether it was buggy. It doesn't matter whether it was malicious or on purpose. It doesn't matter whether it was upgraded to have smarter behavior. Nothing that the, that the auction can do can cause someone who, who is a losing bidder who did not get the concert ticket to not be able to get their money back. The only way that the auction can get the money from a bidder is if they provide the requirements of the bidder, which is a concert ticket on the other side. 
Okay, that's what we call offer safety. And the reason we call it safety is safety properties are things that they just eliminate a large class of bugs, right? Memory safety, type safety, all of those are software engineering safety properties. They didn't fix everything, but they eliminated a large class of bugs. In our case, in the case of blockchain, many of the bugs that were encountered already that people lost tens of millions of dollars for were bugs that were either concurrency safety, like reentrancy bugs that bit, you know, Polkadot and, 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 and various other uh, chains or, 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 um, uh, or the, the original DAO contracts, those sorts of things, or, um, uh, 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 you know, that memory safety, concurrency safety. In this case, this is the same kind of safety property where, where there's a large class of bugs where, you know, if I don't have to worry about the behavior of the contract to get my money back, then I'm just, systematically all throughout the system, much, much safer. And then this also provides the contract you know, access to, to, to asynchronously avail, synchronous access to assets that are only available asynchronously because they are across multiple different chains, across IBC, those kinds of things. Um, and it has assured, the contract has assurance that the offered goods match what they said they were providing and that assets will be delivered upon completion of the, uh, of the contract or on exit of any particular offer position. And so those assurances, you know, are quite nice, particularly when you want to be able to interact in a multi-chain environment where you are connecting to assets across multiple different chains. Okay. So the client side of that, one more slide and then we'll go back to code here. The client side of that, you know, since in the in the UI, that was all bundled up in what the UI is doing. And we'll and and there'll be a workshop tomorrow where we dig more into how is the whole plumbing of, of adapt work. But the client side of that starts with an invitation. I've got an auction. You are invited to take a seat at the table to participate in this auction. So you have an invite that you got through various mechanisms and there's, and it depends on the DAP. In this case, behind the scenes, I went to the website. It has a service that can just provide me an information to get money from the faucet, right? Or I've got a website, you know, that I've got an application that it gives me an information to bid for a concert ticket. So now I have a seat in the auction. I'm going to make an offer. I put together the proposal that says, in this case, I want CE4. This is a non-fungible token, E4. Um, I'm willing to pay 100, up to 100 moolah for it. So I want to see, I will give you 100 moolah and, um, and I can exit whenever the heck I want. That's the on-demand, which is the default case, but I just put it in here because we'll be talking about an over-the-counter trading desk and covered calls where I might actually have to, in order to place a bid, be able to say, and my offer is good until next Thursday. Right, and so the, 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 this is what, what, under what circumstances can I demand my money back and have the contract infrastructure deliver it to me independent of the behavior of the contract, right? Okay, so a proposal is, here's what I want, here's what I'm willing to give for it, and here's, here's how I get my money back, or when I can get my money back. And then there's the payment of assets to cor that correspond to, here's what I'm willing to give for it. So I'm just gonna withdraw the same amount of moolah. So now I've got a payment for 100 moolah that corresponds to the price that I described I was willing to pay. And then I ask Zoe, I say, okay, here's an offer. Here's the invitation, here's the proposal, here's the payment, that together makes up an offer. And what I get back is my seat at the table to be able to see what's going on, track the offer, change the state, demand my payouts, exit completely, all the kinds of things that I need to be able to interact with that dynamically while a long-lived offer is outstanding um, is my, what's called the user seat, okay? And that's what the client gets to be able to interact with their stuff, including, you know, most importantly, being able to get their payouts when it's all done. So once the auction is completed, it'll, it'll, it'll be exited and the, the client will get their payouts, standard JavaScript, they can wait their payouts and then deposit it somewhere or what have you. Now, all of th this is the mechanic if I was doing it programmatically. Obviously, the wallet is doing some of this for me, where when I said, here's an offer, great. I will say, here's where I want the payouts to go when you finally get them, approve that offer, send it off to the contract. And so the wallet is the one that takes that proposal, pulls the money out of the, out of the purses, and sends off the offer. And so the, the, the contract at the other end gets the offer. Okay. So before we dive into the next contract, let's now look at what some of that code looks like. So that that's you know, back to the, 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 the interaction that happened when I said I want some tokens, it made an offer that was this one-sided offer of, of, you know, I want something, but I'm not giving you anything. So I, we just don't bother to show the gift, right? <clears throat> okay. 
So what does that code look like? Well, remember I said we'll just bring up VS Code. Let's see what let's see what happened with that. It might have gone to the other the other uh, uh, machine. Yes, it did. Let me let me move that over here. Actually, you know what? I'll just pop it up here. Okay. So I showed you the the fungible faucet. I'm just going to dive into the contract here, which has you know, excuse me, which does have test codes. Now, one of the important things is this is just JavaScript, right? So here is the contract code. Is this large enough for people to read? It looks good. So the contract is just a JavaScript module. It contains a single function <coughs> called start for starting the contract that takes as an argument access to the, the Zoe contract facet it's called. That's, that's the inside of a contract box is the thing to be for, for the contract to be able to talk about the state of all offers outstanding to the contract, do its reallocates to assign the concert ticket to the winner and the money to the to the seller, that kind of thing. Okay. So the first thing this concert, th th this, sorry, this is the faucet, right? The first thing it does is it creates a mint for minting those tokens, minting the tokens that you're going to be able to demand for free from the faucet. This could have been constructed to take a mint that was provided from outside. In this case, we wanted to show you here's how, you know, this is all it takes to create a mint. There's one more argument if you want to create a mint for a non fungible token to define the, 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 you know, whether it's separate strings or whether it's a JavaScript structure to describe it, to describe amounts or what have you. But, 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 you know, fundamentally, that's all you do. Now I get what a, a, a mint object that has the ability to mint um, uh, new uh, uh, tokens associated with this particular mint. And this has the set of elements that go into this issuer kit that I mentioned. So I can get from it the issuer that lets me verify that, you know, the issuer that I can hand out generally and make generally public. So anyone that I want to be able to recognize my tokens can use the issuer with a JavaScript object and say, are you a payment for those, for those kinds of tokens? If so, give me exclusive access, right? And if not, fail. Right. And so that's the issue where that's the verifier side, you know, or the, the signing key, you know, the verification key to correspond to the mint signing key, if you will. And then the amount math, if, you know, people are familiar with JavaScript, when you want to do anything beyond plus minus and times, you use, you know, the, the, the math object in the normal JavaScript namespace. We have a similar kind of thing for amounts to be able to do interesting math on amounts. So I can, you know, take two sets of seats at a concert venue and combine them together. Um, or I can check whether the one you gave me is in that set or those kinds of things, or I can add to, you know, amounts of simoleons and get another pile of simoleons. So that's just, you know, simple math abstraction. And the fundamental action this, this contract has to take is to mint a payment, right? That's the main thing that happens is it mints a payment, <clears throat> okay? Okay, um, so this here, this function here is what is called an offer handler. And, you know, I talked about there being proposals and offers. This is just the code inside the contract that will, that will be invoked when the contract is delivered an offer. Okay. So the first step, as, as, as I showed in the, in the slide before is the, 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 the client gets an invitation. The invitation is associated with, with, with a particular offer handler inside the client. And I'll show you how that happens. So this offer handler will be invoked when someone says, hey, I, I'm in a faucet, please give me something. The argument here, this seat, is the internal seat that allows the contract to talk about the offer position from the contract's perspective. So the user seat is the seat, is the place to stand to talk about a particular offer from the client's perspective. The ZCF seat inside the contract is the object to be able to talk about that same offer from the contract's perspective. Okay. And so here we've got, you know, there was a, this is, this is two nested functions. This is, you know, clever JavaScript formatting. It's just straightforward JavaScript, where when I created this mint function, I said, I wanted a mint function to be able to create mint payment for a thousand, uh, uh, a, a thousand simoleons. And so here, this is going to get it, you know, a thousand is the number. It's going to use the amount math to make the, the, the amount description that says not a thousand, which has no units and, you know, lots of systems that deal in just numbers. I mean, plenty of Ethereum bugs. It's not just Ethereum bugs, but when, you know, brokerage houses are first going electronic and moving onto the internet, 
every single one of them had a bug where something that was supposed to be, you know, shares instead got, got, got sent as dollars and suddenly you had a corruption in the user's uh, account reporting. So having raw numbers as a thing that you're computing financial stuff, that's well known in the financial industry as being a bad idea if you can avoid it. And so amounts really wrap that up where, no, no, we're not going to pass around a thousand. We're going to pass around a thousand simoleons, and that's what we're doing math about. And you cannot add a thousand simoleons to a thousand concert tickets and get a coherent number. That doesn't make, that's a bad idea. You want your system to stop you from doing that, right? So this produces an amount that is a thousand uh, um, uh, moolah in this case. And then the mint operation, here there's a couple of different mint operations. This internal mint mints it directly to the seat. So this is, I don't want to create the payment and then have to go deposit the payment and do all that sort of stuff. I'm just saying, you know, on that seat that came in, the, 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 the offer state, the set, of, the set of assets associated with that offer, give them this amount of tokens. Okay, so that's the mint it and give it to that seat and then exit the seat. The seat is now done. It's got a thousand tokens. You can now do all of the payouts where the payout in this case is give them a thousand tokens. Okay. So that's essentially the extent of the, the, the extent of the contract, the extent of this contract. Okay. And um, uh, okay. So, or the, rather the core operation of this contract. So now let's talk about how it's all wired up and then we'll go to a fancier contract that has the same thing. So what happened up here is I created this contract. I've got this handler that I'm going to want to deal with. Right. <clears throat> and I say, remember everything starts with an invitation. So here, the creator facet is, you know, facet is, you know, an object of a multifaceted thing, but it's just sort of one object. The creator facet is the object that the creator of the faucet is going to have access to, to get everything set up. And so what the creator of the faucet will be able to do is make an invitation. <clears throat> um, oh yes, I, I will talk about that in just a moment. So, so they will make an invitation. So indeed, you know, back to, to one of the things about this being in VS Code, this being able to use familiar tools, right? If I hover over this, you can see that it's got the TypeScript types. So behind the scenes, we have all the typing to be able to do, um, uh, 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 you know, easy, easy, complete. If I just, you know, go here and get rid of this and say dot, you know, what are the operations I have available to me? You know, I can do the various things or start typing and it does all the normal kind of developer experience that you would expect in the outside world doing FinTech or other applications. We provide, we bring the same thing into, into being able to build smart contracts. And so this is standard JavaScript with all the standard tools. Indeed, if I, you know, bring up a, a terminal window, um, let me go to the contract directory um, uh, and uh, I will go ahead and say, I think I can do this yarn test. And that will now run the unit tests, um, which, you know, even verbose mode for this unit test is, is, is that it passes. You know, you can look at the test. It's a standard kind of test that you get with, with um, TDD systems that it's going to go through that state of launch the contract, instantiate an instance, make an invitation, make an offer, check all of the results, do some assertions at the end, right? So standard unit test frameworks, CI, automation, all those kinds of things work in these frameworks. <clears throat> okay, so going back, for my contract, the thing that the creator of the faucet needs to be able to do is make invitations and then check that it got, the, and get the issuer to be able to publish it so that it can enable people to be able to verify that they actually got the tokens that this contract is proposing to produce for them. And so that make invitation operation, it's the thing that's invoking this mint payment to, to default to a thousand, you know, to, to, to setting, setting the amount that you get from the faucet to be a thousand simoleons here, or a thousand tokens rather. Um, so it then calls Zoe, calls, calls the Zoe internal facet, this ZCF Zoe contract facet to say, make me an invitation where the handler is mint payment for that extent. Right, so the handler is going to be this handler up here. So when anyone makes an offer using that invitation, this is the code that will be this will this is the code that will be executed. This this mint payment underneath. So that's the wiring that happens. Then some then then we have the additional wrinkle that anyone in the system ought to be able to uh, just find out 
get an issuer so that they can verify that the, that the particular tokens are what they're supposed to be. <laughs> I see that, Dan. Thank you for your excitement. We loved it. It was so exciting when types uh, got working in the system, being able to do this sort of thing and, and you know, check, oh, that returns an issuer. Oh, you know, what, what, what does that take? You know, what is, what, you know, what am I supposed to return from this function? All those kinds of things. Just huge, huge, huge step up in developer experience. Okay. Um, so there are two things that are being returned from this, from this, uh, from create, from the start function here, right? The start function is this entire contract and it's going to return a record that has multiple different things. In this particular contract, it has an object that the owner, the creator of this faucet is allowed to manage in order to get invites and decide who's allowed to tap the faucet and something for the public that anyone in the system, anyone, anyone um, on the chain is able to look at in order to be able to verify that the tokens that they got from some, from, from some process are the tokens that this faucet produced. And so these are these two objects. One is I can make an, the, the creator can make an invitation and anyone on the, on the chain can get the issuer to be able to verify or claim assets from this faucet. Okay, so that's the entirety of this contract. Right, and then the UI just pulls it all together. That's the whole. That's the whole faucet. Okay, and then you can, you know, you can dig yourself into the UI directories and the API directories. Um, we'll be talking more about that at, at at a workshop tomorrow. But I want to move on to other contracts. So, let me see where we're at on our presentation. Let's now move to the next contract on our list, the OTC contract. Okay, so if I go to the now in this case, I'm not. Whoops, let me. Stop here. In this case, I'm not going to go to the OTC. I'm not going to reinstall it. I'm just going to navigate to it in that in that in that window I had over here. So let me go cd dot dot slash dot dot cd dap OTC and code dot standard development environment things. Okay. And here is this application. Let me make it a little bigger for you. That's a little too big. And now maybe you can see the application. And you can see Kate commenting on the types in the system. Um, indeed, you know, the, the, the up here in my imports is where um, uh, I grabbed the exported types for Zoe and there are plenty of other types in the system. I turned on, to, on we, we turned on um, TypeScript checking here inside of this JavaScript. Now, I will note there are reasons why we specifically code in JavaScript, but want TypeScript as a helper for us. We can talk about that later. Okay. How am I doing on time? Ooh. I will rush through this and I apologize. So this is the OTC desk. An OTC desk is, you know, the creator of this contract has the ability to create quotes and give them to people who want them. So this is like an automated market maker. You know, Hasib had a paper about destructuring um, uh, 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 Uniswap. So this is like an automated market maker, but with an off chain Oracle that gets to decide on whatever pricing they want to do. Right. So over the counter desks have been doing this for, for a long time. If I, as a customer can go and just say, give me a quote and it's a better quote than I would get from, from the on chain AMM and I get in a timely fashion, I'm a happy camper, right? It's better pricing for me. And the fact that they did some magic behind the scenes to figure out a price, I don't care as long as it's a good one. So this is the contract for the OTC desk to be able to provide those quotes. So I am the person answering the phone, listening to Skype, or more likely, you know, there's a website that talks to my, my service that says, hey, I want to sell, you know, a thousand of these tokens from the faucet. What can I get for them? You know, what can I, you know, and I want to sell them in exchange for uh, atoms. What can I, you know, what, what price are you giving? Okay. okay, so this contract, when it starts up, it starts with, um, it, it uses another contract. So this is now showing the composition strategy. And I'll come back to this other contract in a minute. But this as an OTC desk, as a broker, has an internal seat. Remember, seats are the things to be able to manage an allocation and a set of positions, typically associated with an offer. But contracts can have seats inside themselves for managing you know, liquidity tokens, internal liquidity pools, whatever it is. Same interface, very simple API. It all composes with everything else. So it has an internal seat, which I, which we call the market maker seat, right? Where that's just the pool of inventory uh, that the market maker has to be able to buy and sell and trade, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, tokens for atoms. Okay. 
And the main thing that they behave that they write, remember the creator facet is what the creator of this contract is able to do. And the main thing that they're able to do, well, they can add inventory. I won't go through the details of that. They can remove inventory. I won't go through the details of that. And they can make a quote. Okay, so that's the main business is I'm going to make a quote for someone. They're going to take the quote. They will be paid their quote out of my inventory. Um, and I will get the money and put that in the other side of my inventory. So if I'm trading, you know, tokens for, um, uh, uh, for atoms, then I've got an inventory of tokens and atoms and I'm buying and selling out of those. That's the job of a market. Okay, so how does this make quote work? Well, in this case, you know, I could claim that I'm going to give you a particular price and then you come back and want to buy it. And I say, yeah, I decided not to. Well, that's not a very useful market maker. That's not a very useful uh, quote desk for you because, you know, they could say anything they want. You then decide not to buy on, on Uniswap and then you come back and you can't and your quote isn't on it. So what do we do instead? One of the reusable pieces that I mentioned is a covered call. A covered call option, you know, call option is an object that I have that I, if I get a call option from you, I might pay you 10 bucks, um, you know, uh, 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 10 bucks to get a call option that will let me buy, um, you know, Apple shares from you anytime before, you know, 100 Apple shares from you anytime before next week for this many ETH, right? And that's a call option. It's a covered call option if the contract is guaranteed to actually have the Apple shares in it so that I am sure that I will get them. Now, I, I used Apple shares, that's an off-chain asset. Let's say, let's say in, in this case, I'm doing a quote. I said I'm doing um, uh, uh, tokens for atoms. So what I want is I want to get a covered call where if I pay you 100 tokens, you will give me, you know, five atoms, okay? And so the covered call only is covered if it actually internally has those atoms with it and has the ability for me to exercise to be able to pay you and get those atoms out. And then you get the, the amount that I pay, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. And the nice thing about that is if we do that as a separate contract that is separately reviewed, now you as the client don't need to know anything about how the, how the OTC desk works. You don't have to trust the OTC desk you just have to be able to get a new instance of that covered call contract and be able to trust it, okay? I'm gonna say a lot more about that because that's the most powerful composition is when, when in, fact, in this case, it was Kate Sills who's answering questions in chat, when she wrote this OTC desk, right? She was able to write it where she can do anything she wanted as long as once a quote happens, it's in the form of this already existing covered call. Now no one needs to, you know, no one needs to understand this thing. And she got to build it using that other piece unchained. It's unchanged. It's not that she copied it. It's that she got to use it unchanged. Okay. We're going to go a little, you know, a little bit over, but not a lot over. Right? So, so um, I will try and get through the, the main point here and then you, and, and then get you to the next slide and, and, and we'll be done. Okay. So here what's happening is it's actually going to start an instance of the covered call. So this contract doesn't actually care what the implementation of covered call is. That's a separate contract, but it was created when this contract was created, the creator of this that deployed this desk said, here's the covered call implementation that I'm using. I'm probably going to use the standard one that everyone will recognize so that when they, when they receive it, they already have an issuer in their wallet that will verify and go, yep, that's the trusted covered call in, in, uh, implementation. That's one that was reviewed, you know, four stars on, on, on um, uh, uh, contract Yelp, whatever it is. Right? Um, and so I'm going to instantiate a brand new instance just for this quote. Right. And that means it's now independent of all the other quotes. You know, they all they're, they're all independent of each other. Um, I'm going to propose to it that I will give the assets that the person requested. So, so they said they want, you know, five atoms. I will give five of my atoms for the price that I'm or, sorry. Um, the quote is I'm willing to give them five atoms for the amount of, of tokens they said they were providing. So I'm going to give them that quote. So I provide the atoms. I provide the description of the atoms. I say my proposal is, yep, I will give you five atoms for, for your hundred um, tokens. Um, and it's good until the deadline, right? So my, I'm saying, and this quote is good for 15 minutes. If you don't exercise it by then, it's not good anymore. And I get the, and I get all the money back. 
The interesting thing is this is different from that on-demand thing where the quote desk, the, the OTC desk, can't just get its money back at any time. So it gives you one and then site pulls the assets out. No, no, it has committed the assets until this deadline is over. And that's committed in a way that you as the customer can actually verify. And indeed, you can have constructed your offer so that, so that um, you're automatically verifying that in the process of getting the quote from this system. Okay, so I am, uh, so, so I'm gonna give you five atoms for your 100 tokens. Um, you can exercise it any time in the next 15 minutes. Um, but, that, but, but remember, these are just the description of five atoms. That's like telling you $20 doesn't mean I gave you a $20 bill, right? So then I withdraw from the market maker seat those, a, the, those assets, right? The, the assets that, 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 that I said, the five atoms, I'm going to draw them out of the, of the offer seat, and then I'm going to go ahead and make that offer with those payments. So I'm going, to, I'm going to offer to, oh, let me, for clarity, here's an example of where, um, uh, so here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. Control J, um, uh, yarn run Ava dash W, right? And I think, oh, no, I wanted to go, sorry, I wanted to go to uh, the contract directory. So I'm now running this, but again, standard tool. So this is in watch mode. It'll run the test once. Oh, and I already broke it somehow. Ah, I'm not running under, never mind. I will run, I will run, I will just, the, the, the test runs, but, but in this particular instance, I'm not set up to be able to run it uh, uh, iteratively. Um, uh, so, let's see if I can do this. Does work? Nope, doesn't work. Okay. I, I, will, I will go back. You saw the test run earlier. I will not try and do the watch thing. Normally when we iterate, and you can see in, in, in a more detailed uh, walkthrough of, uh, uh, from, from a month ago, the code with us in Cosmos is where Kate actually built this contract. And she did so using TDD, where every time you save, the, the tests rerun from scratch. And so I'm going to make a change here where creator invitation, I'm, I'm losing that. That gets me confused. I'm going to go ahead and use my refactoring tools to rename that to the covered call. Uh, invitation so that this code is more readable, right? And so now, um, uh, and, and, and it is, it being a, a, you know, standard JavaScript with all the fancy tools, you know, there you go. Okay, so now I'm withdrawing my five atoms, offering them to this brand new instantiated cover call that has no assets in it and saying, here's the stuff that are the, the you know, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to offer my assets for this price and I get back now the, the, the object, if you will, the seat, which is that client seat uh, for the covered call. I'm now going to return that client seat for the covered call as the result of this quote. So the quote is not, here's a number. The quote is not, um, you know, here's something that you could do and maybe I'll honor it and maybe I won't. The quote is an honest to God, completely independent covered call instance that can be separately verified to meet the covered call implementation um, for a customer, right? And it has closed in it. It has the, the actual atoms that the, that the covered call is for so that the user could invoke the exercise operation in order to see those atoms. Now I said that this was a pre-existing contract. So let's go look at where that is. Um, I will come back to that in a moment. If I go to, uh, another visual studio, this is the Agoric SDK that you all installed. You know, again, standard tool, so I can go to covered call in my, in my thing. There are, you can see that it is one of many contracts over here. Remember, I mentioned the several other contracts, sell items, simple exchange, atomic swap, et cetera. This is the covered call implementation. And it has, you know, fundamentally, it has an exercise. You know, it has an operation for the owner of the covered call that was given that client seat to be able to exercise the option. And they exercise the option by providing the, 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 the 100 tokens. In exchange, they will get an exact swap of the 100 tokens for the five atoms underneath. And this covered call is, you know, 20 some odd lines of code. Um, and it implements that in a way where it can be reused for selling, you know, atoms for tokens that are brand new issued. It can sell concert tickets, which are an NFT. It could be used for async access 
to, to, you know, to sell a covered call where I will give you remoted die over Peggy in exchange for remoted atoms from the hub. Um, and so these same abstractions are completely reusable securely and composably across a wide variety of, of, of digital assets that you will build in your smart contract. And so a big part of building an app is breaking it up into these nice separately reviewable components, separately securable, separately verifiable components that can then be reused in multiple ways. That OTC desk uses the covered call. There's a, there's a market application that can use the covered call. You know, it's the kind of thing that we'll be able to use inside of, 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 of several different DeFi trading applications. There's a similar thing for a call spread that is a purely financial instrument that is equally simple, but focused on a, on a different overlapping set of DeFi use cases and so forth. Okay, so now finally, let me jump back. So what we got, and wrapping up here, um, we showed on the client side, you get an invitation, you make a proposal, you make your offer, you get a user seat back, and finally you get some payouts. And the net pay payoff of offer safety there is you either get your desired payout or you're guaranteed to get a refund independent of misbehavior of the contracts. And the important thing is that's not just at the wallet level, it's not just at the user level. It means that if I have a autonomous portfolio manager that is interacting with dynamic markets and AMMs, it gets the same offer safety. And so you've got pervasive improvement in the safety across an ecosystem of communicating contracts, which means, for example, our stablecoin implementation, you know, for the local currency of our of our uh, uh, of the chain we will be rolling out next year, you know, it can automatically liquidate on a local market, on a local AMM, on a local auction, um, in a way that it can do it autonomously and be protected from misbehavior of those auctions, which means that it could actually use third party auctions. And now new DeFi abstractions can actually extend the underlying dynamic economy and the underlying stablecoin infrastructure and so forth. <laughs> and then finally, and then finally for contracts, as I said, you, you have the pieces where when those offer come in, comes in for a given invitation, it will evoke, uh, invoke a particular offer handler that gives it a ZCF seat that gives it access to the state and execution and, and status and so forth of the, current, uh, uh, of the current offer. The contract can reallocate in order to, you know, make multi-way trades between several different parties. So a barter application might be doing, you know, trades of his chickens for your pigs for his goats, right? And, 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 and so you can have multi-party transactions that are required for for example, in a multiple auto swap, there are the multiple different uh, internal seats for liquidity pools. There's the incoming offer, there might be counterparties. All of those can be atomic re atomically reallocated at once. And that will only succeed if it meets the offer constraints of every single position uh, in, that, in that transaction. And then finally, there's exit that provides those payouts that the clients are really interested in. So next steps, please share your feedback. Um, the links here, uh, um, we, we will paste into the Zoom chat. Whoops, sorry. Um, we will paste into the Zoom chat. Um, and we have the Cosmos DeFi Hackathon. The, the, it's called uh, Hack Adam 5 is starting actually five minutes ago. Um, there will be, you know, there will be presentations. There will be a wide variety of, of, of platforms to build on. We, this, this system is built on top of Tendermint and Cosmos and optimized for DeFi. We're one of the platforms you'll be able to build on there. So there'll be prizes. There will be more workshops on this. So independent of that, if you're interested in seeing how it wires up to the UI and a longer workshop to actually go through and build some of these things, that'll be happening tomorrow morning. And then I will be presenting on some of how this same component model you're using for the, the simple economics of trade and so forth also apply to reusable governance instruments. Because you know, as you know, there's a wide variety of, of whoops, uh, there's a wide variety of of um, uh, uh, contracts where as soon as you've got a liquidity token, now suddenly someone wants to add governance, and and you know you want to you want to be able to succeed like Uni did, not have it blow up in your face like some of these other uh, uh, people that have copied code have. And being able to reuse a safe, verified component is just much safer. That's the DeFi Legos model, and that's what that that we need. You know. Any system that's going to take us to the next level of DeFi requires that. So please check out the alpha, build on our system, and help us make DeFi more exciting and a whole lot less dangerous. <laughs>